Thank you, Margie. Good morning, everybody. Welcome to Cross Point Church. Whether you are here in person or online, I am super excited to be bringing the Word of God to you today. Um, my name is Michael Allen. I am the associate pastor here. At <laughs> I have no idea who that was, but thank you. It was, oh, it was, okay. <laughs> uh, no pressure to me now. Um, <laughs> one of my favorite things to do is to bring the Word of God to us. Um, oh, I should probably also say, by the way, Children's Church, you are dismissed. <laughs> as much as I would love for you all to stay and listen to me. Um, <laughs> um, one of my favorite things to do is bring the Word of God, and part of the reason why that's one of my favorite things is because um, I don't have to have an, a horribly original thought, right? I don't have to be overly creative with it. I don't have to tell you or come up with weird concoctions for how life lives, how you need to live life, because Scripture is really, 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 really clear. And it gives us a wisdom that goes beyond ourselves and goes beyond our own tendencies, our own sin. If you're a believer, we would say that. And so I'm really excited to bring the Word of God to you today as we continue in our series, Money Talks. So thank you to Dave for giving me the opportunity to speak. I want to apologize for missing all of you on January 1st. I was supposed to preach that Sunday, and I got COVID after dodging, ducking, dipping, diving, and dodging for two and a half years. It finally caught up with me. Uh, so thank you to Jim Black. I saw him around here somewhere. Um, there he is. Um, thank you for Jim, to Jim Black for stepping in. I missed you all that day. But I'm back and ready to bring the word of God. So today is the day the Lord has made. Amen? All right. So uh, when my wife Naomi and I lived in another town for a few years, we went to a rather large church while we were there. And while we were there, we tithed regularly. All right? This is setting up what we're going to talk about today, so you might get, get the point as we go through. So we tithed regularly. And at the end of our time in that town, God called us back home to Rockford, which was really exciting for us. And as we left, there was a, we'll call it a disruption at the church that we went to. It was, it was pretty significant, and a lot of things that had been happening for a number of years had been coming to light. Things that happened in the leadership and, and through the, the church administration. And this church went through a really heavy season of pain, people leaving the church, uh, a needed changeover of leadership as, as these things came to light. And I'm truly happy to say that this church is still around it's changed pretty significantly, but so many churches these days have, have to close as a result of these things. Uh, people kind of flee to the hills, sometimes understandably so. But the church is still around, it looks different, and it didn't have to close. But one of the things that came to light through the implosion, is maybe a more accurate word, was a rather egregious misuse of church funds. There's still discussions even happening today between outsiders and insiders and people who left the church and people who are still there as to whether or not the way those funds were used was truly inappropriate or not. More important to the conversation is the feelings of hurt, betrayal, mistrust that many of the people in the congregation felt, some still feel, when the way that these funds were used came to light. Over the past several weeks, we've been talking about how money matters, right? The money talks, as it were. And, and this is true for the local arm of the global body known as the church. We in the West think of it as the organized church, right? And sometimes we get upset with how a church uses its funds. Maybe some of you can relate to that, right? This could be the result of a, a real conviction from God. There are real reasons to be upset with how a church is using its funds, Though it can also swing the other way, where there's a frustration out of a lack of control. I don't think that they should have spent their money that way. I don't think that was the best use of those funds. We, we feel a need to control, right, a, a, a draw, a desire to continue to control what we consider to be our money, right? That's how we think about it. And so the last couple of weeks, Dave has been talking about this, like, individual aspect of money, how you just in your day-to-day -to -day life, use money. Today we're going to talk a little bit about how that interacts with the church. Because the way that we 
use our money, the way that we steward our money more accurately, as we talked about last week, it matters a great deal. There's only one person in this entire world that you can control. Only one person that I can control. You. Right? I can only control me. We often try to manipulate control, oftentimes through money or the, the use of it, or legislate others' actions, but ultimately you only ever have control over yourself. And that's all that God is asking you to be responsible for, by the way. God's not asking you to be responsible for others' act- other actions. One of the things that we do, though, is we start to view our money and our possessions as an extension of our self-control, our self-determination. And so we have a hard time letting go, right, without feeling like we should still have a say in how those funds are used. Hence, we get frustrated with churches who maybe use them in ways we don't appreciate or don't agree with. And how many times, not even just in a church context, but how many times have you thought, said, or even acted upon like, this, this idea that, well, since it's my money, right, since it's my money, it has to be used this way. Right? I've, I've had this thought. I still have this thought occasionally. I have this thought, especially as it relates to how the government uses taxes. I wish that I could tell, tell the government as I'm turning in taxes, I want you to use this for this and this and this, none of this other stuff, right? I've had this thought uh, when I'm giving somebody money, right? When I'm gifting them the money, I'm like, I'm giving you this money, but you need to use it this way, right? And yeah, I've even had this thought when giving money to a church. This idea is magnified. This idea of like we want to be able to control our money even after we've said we're giving it, right, is magnified by our culture because we live in an individualist culture with a capitalist economy. It's not a dig, it's just a a reality to where we live. Because we are told in every area of life, every area of life, well, tell them with your checkbook, right? If you're younger, tell them with your bank statement, tell them with your Venmo history or your Cash App history or PayPal history. Right? You may not know what a checkbook is. So we're told if you're unhappy with where an organization is spending its money or if you're unhappy with what they're doing, right, you stop spending money with them. And this isn't actually an inherently bad perspective. I actually agree with it within the context of the marketplace. But how many of us make the mistake of confusing the church for something that exists in the marketplace? We think of this organized Organi- or this organization, right? We think of this organization as being a peddler of a product, right? A place where I can go to feel good, see my friends, maybe become a better person, definitely leave feeling like a superior person to how I was before. But it's really, it's about me and what I need, what I want to hear, what makes me comfortable. I've had times in my life where that's my perspective and our, the tendency is, and you'll hear people lament this, where if they are uncomfortable, if you're not getting this idea of, oh, well, you're just a great person exactly how you are and God doesn't ask you to change, people church hop, right? They leave, they take their money, they speak with their money, and they go somewhere else. And again, and I'll reiterate this a few times, there are times when you should leave a church. There are times when you should do that. But that isn't the church, biblically speaking, right? We, the people who are indwelt by the Spirit of God, we are the church. This event happening right now and happening in places all across the city, that's not church. This is a gathering of the church. Now, we, we change our language, and, and it's just easier to say, well, I'm going to church or, or I'm, I'm attending church. That's easier for us, but we confuse then what that is, and we forget that this exists, this organization exists in this weird tension. Right? There's this tension between our existence in a culture, right, and in an economy, with the fact that we have a spiritual function, something that goes beyond individualism or uh, communalism, something that goes beyond capitalism or socialism or any of the other economies. The function that we're performing here is different. So I get to have the conversation with everybody about tithing, Yay! (laughs) Um, And if you've been around church for a while, you already know what that is likely. I'm going to define it in a second, but can I just say, like, I just have to be really frank, like, no pastor likes having this conversation. It's it's uncomfortable. I'm wearing black so you don't see my pit stains, okay? (laughs) 
The, the back of the neck gets a little sweaty. The back of the ears turn a little red. Please understand that there are things about God's word that make us uncomfortable. And this can be one of them. And it's for all the reasons Dave has been talking about for the past couple weeks. We like our money. And we equate money a lot of times to power or to self-determination or to an extension of our self-governance. So we don't like talking about it. But we're going to talk about it. So here we go. Um, <laughs> so there's three general categories of money giving in Scripture. And this is, this is kind of a broad overview. Um, but you have tithes, right? You have offerings, and you have alms. All three of these actually function differently. They function differently spiritually. They function a little differently even psychologically. I wish I could go into all that. It's super interesting. But what we're going to talk about today is specifically the tithes part with a little bit of the offerings sprinkled in. So the tithe is the first 10% of your income. Tithe literally means tenth. It's not like a fancy word. The, the Israelites are not the only uh, nation that practiced a tithe. Ancient Egypt did. Ancient Babylon did. All of them had a tithe. It was, it's this idea of taking the first tenth of your produce and bringing it to wherever you put your ruler, wherever you put your, your taxes. Right, we'll say that word. But I've already said it once. I guess I, can't, I don't need to make a big deal of it now. But it's this idea of taking the first fruits we today, in our culture, in our context, would say the first 10% of our income. Okay, so that's what a tithe is talking about. An offering, an offering is money that still gets presented to the ministry work of the Lord. But it's money that goes above and beyond the tenth. Goes above and beyond the tithe, right? And this is just definitions that we see expanded on in Scripture. And so this is the idea of once you, if you give 15% to the church regularly, great, 5% of that is considered an offering. Right? If you spend $600 on a delicious cheesecake at the pie, pie auction, that's considered an offering. Right? It's something that would go above and beyond the tithe. That actually did happen, by the way. I don't know if you guys know that somebody spent $600 on a pie. I hope it was good. Who bought it? Are they here? Was it Jim? Oh. <laughs> I don't remember who bought it, but I hope that it was delicious. Um, and then finally, we have alms. Alms, you can think of as the money that we, we sow into the world. Right? The world is, has no shortage of people who are just in need. And some of that need is financial, but alms doesn't just refer to finances. It often does, but it's just the money that we sow without any kind of an expectation of, of a return. Okay, so we have tithes, offerings, and alms. So let's talk about tithes. We're going to turn in our Bible to everyone's favorite book, the book of Malachi. All right? Um, if you are unfamiliar with where Malachi is, uh, it is the last book in the Old Testament. So it might be easier for some of you to find the book of Matthew and then go just to the book right before it and you'll find Malachi. We're going to be in chapter 3. Um, I have one point for you today from this text. One point and one point only. Tithing demonstrates trust. That's all the tithing is. Okay? It's demonstrating trust. And so let's hop in with Malachi so Malachi is a prophet to God's people. And so in this, in this scroll, he's, there, he's casting out a rebuke, a condemnation of God's chosen people who have begun to doubt God's faithfulness. And they've been living in ways that are contrary to God's justice, his mercy, and his holiness. And so when we get to this tithe conversation, we've, there's already been several rebukes laid on Israel, laid on the religious leaders, laid on the nation. It's, it's a really intense read. I highly recommend it to, to go through. It's four chapters. You can read it really quickly, but I would take your time through it. But we're going to start in chapter 3, verse 6. Chapter 3, verse 6. And I'm going to read uh, verses 6 through 10, and then I'll, I'll talk through them after. And this is God speaking to the nation of Israel through Malachi. God says, For I, the Lord, do not change, therefore you... O children of Jacob, are not consumed. From the days of your fathers, you have turned aside from my statutes and have not kept them. Return to me, and I will return to you, says the Lord of hosts. But you say, how shall we return? Well, will, rob, will man rob God? Yet you are robbing me. But you say, how have we robbed you? In your tithes and contributions. 
You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. Bring the full tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. And thereby put me to the test, says the Lord of hosts, if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down for you a blessing until there is no more need. One of the things that's interesting to me in this is that these rebukes have gone through a series of kind of rhetorical questions. So God asks a rhetorical question and of Israel, and then he a- answers the question, right? But in this one, he starts first by placing the next rebuke against his immutability, right? His unchangingness. He says, the Lord does not change. And then he combines that with his faithfulness, right? Therefore, you, O children of Jacob, are not consumed. Because, see, he's made a promise that he's not going to allow them to be consumed. And so that's held true, even though, in the next sentence, even though they have been unfaithful to him. See, it's, it's interesting because what, what's happening is, you can think of it like Dave set up this, this, this uh, volleyball shot and, and God's coming with the spike to talk about repentance, right? Repentance, uh, our treasure indicates our repentance is something that Dave talked about. And so they've been unfaithful and God says, return to me and I'll return to you. And the next logical question is, okay, God, how do we return to you? And then there's this weird shift, like it feels almost like a non sequitur where it doesn't seem to necessarily follow because God's response to that question is, will man rob God? Yet you've been robbing me. They ask, right, in this, in this rhetorical question, how shall we return to you? And God says, well, you've been robbing me. And that could be understandably confusing, especially when we think about the fact that over these past few weeks, we've been saying that everything belongs to God anyways. How can we be robbing God if it's all God's to begin with? And so God answers this question, and he says, you're robbing me in your tithes and contributions. You are cursed with a curse, for you are robbing me, the whole nation of you. So robbing someone, robbing someone is not only taking what's not yours. Okay, that's not the only part of robbing. Robbing is also keeping for yourself what belongs to someone else. And here we start to see what God is saying, right? And God is telling them, not only are you robbing me, but it's a widespread condition. The whole nation of you. So many churches fall into this. And here's just a little Bible nugget nerdery for you. Um, The word that we translate as nation from the Hebrew there is in the Old Testament usually a a word that refers to pagan nations. It's not usually the word that is rendered nation when referring to the nation of Israel. And so we have this emphasis where God has said four times in a really short amount of time that they're robbing him, which if you know about Old Testament literature styles, that adds emphasis each time he's repeating the idea. So he's giving them this this gut punch and saying, rob, 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 and you're a, a pagan nation. This rebuke had to, had to hurt. Because God is making abundantly clear to them what he thinks about withholding for ourselves what belongs to God. So God's response, right? The the question that he's answering is, how shall we return to you? Some of you might be asking that question, how do I return to God? And God calls the people of Israel to bring the whole tithe into the storehouse. Now there were three tithes that we can see talked about, three types of tithes that we can see talked about in the Old Testament. So you had the general tithe that was the entire nation, and they would bring the first fruit of the produce of the land to the temple. Then you had the tithe that was expected of the religious leaders, right, the priests and the Levites. So that's the second tithe. And there was a third tithe that was, that was referenced um, that was every three years where the nation would have this tithe that they brought together, and that was then dispersed to uh, the socially disadvantaged, right? The poor, the needy. So God calls Israel to bring the whole tithe in. And that everyone who wants to return, right? This is the implication. If you want to return to God, everyone should participate. 
Some of us have said in our lives, I certainly have, I just feel distant from God like he isn't there. Some of us need to return to God. Because one of the symptoms of our unfaithfulness is where our money is going. And so if you feel distant from God, yet you are not trusting him with your money, right? You're not stewarding his finances well like we talked about last week. Are, are, do you instead need to feel ownership of those, those finances, of those possessions, right? Let me just ask a question that might make us shift a little uncomfortably. Are you robbing God by holding back what's his? Because here's what tithing does. Tithing demonstrates trust. Trust in God, trust in his faithfulness. And won't he do it when we trust in him? Look at the promise, right? So he says, bring the full tithe into the storehouse that there may be food in my house and thereby put me to the test, right? Trust in my faithfulness. I just said I don't change. My faithfulness has rung true because you have not been consumed despite your unfaithfulness. Yet you rob me, so stop robbing me and thereby put me to the test if I will not open the windows of heaven for you and pour down a blessing until there is no more need. What a promise. And we have to be cautious to not confuse a want with a need. There are a lot of pastors in the world who will say, if you just give regularly to this church, God will bless you with health and wealth. That is not what God is saying. That is not what he is saying. Prosperity gospel, run out the church. Leave. But he will make sure that there is no more need. And listen, even before we dig into that, there's a practical side. Like we, and this is part of what makes us uncomfortable sometimes to talk about it. There's a practical side to tithing. You see it? There, bring in the whole tithe that there may be food in my house. See, we, we sometimes forget that the way that the tithe worked in the Old Testament is different in substance than what the tithe is now. But it functions really similarly. See, the tithe was basically food, right? Crop, livestock that was presented to the Levites and the priests. And that was the food and the livestock that they lived on. They, didn't, they weren't farmers themselves. They were the temple. They ran the temple. And so God's saying, bring food into my house. Well, the temple is no longer the dwelling place of God. The church is. Ephesians 2.10, right? Or not 2.10, <laughs> Ephesians 2, right? That we are being built into the dwelling place for God, right? Joined together by Christ Jesus, the cornerstone, right? The church, not this organization, that body of believers I was talking about, we are the dwelling place of God. And so when we give our tithe, we're no longer feeding, in a literal sense, our organized church institution people, but we are caring for them. In the Old Testament, um, this is just so you, to, to give some context, Leviticus 27 describes the, the tithe, and it says, every tithe of the land, every tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the trees is the Lord's. It is holy to the Lord. If a man wishes to redeem some of his tithe, uh, no, I'm going to skip that, every tithe of herds and flocks, every tenth animal of all that pass under the herdsman's staffs shall be holy to the Lord. Do you notice the ownership? The Lord's. And so when you are holding back what is the Lord's, that is, you are robbing God. And so in our culture today, money, right, becomes the kind of symbolic substitute for something else of value, right? The dollar bills and the coins, Right? So whether it's your labor, a product that you sell, a service that you offer, your knowledge, whatever it is, right? that's what the, the money exchange is. And so the Old Testament priests use tithes as their way of being fed. This practical side remains today. And this, this, right, I'm just, I want to be as honest as I can be, is why so many pastors and churches hate talking about tithing. Right? It feels awkward and uncomfortable to talk about because truly, 
it directly impacts whether Dave and myself and Corey and Sarah and Fred get paid. Right? We don't love talking about that. But we need to understand this implication that we as a church are called to be the church together. And if everyone in this congregation decided to stop tithing, please don't. But if everyone in this congregation decided to stop tithing, right, we wouldn't be able to have Dave and myself on staff and Key, right? We wouldn't be able to have a, a brand new children's director, right? We wouldn't be able to, to have Corey, our incredible office admin, who does so much work for the body, so there's this, there's this practical reality, and this is where we return to that tension that even though the church has a spiritual function, we live in a current cultural and historical context, right? We live within an economy, and that economy has expectations to it. We can't dismiss them. So we don't like talking about it, but tithing demonstrates trust, and not, and not just Trust in staff and pastors, that's part of it. But the ultimate thing, right, is trust in God. So we, we, don't, we don't ask you guys to tithe so that we can get a raise, right? We ask you guys to tithe so that you can put God in his right place. What if we don't like where our church is going? Now, I'm not in this moment talking about things like prosperity gospel, right? Again, if, if there's prosperity gospel or, or heresy being preached, run out the door, please. But what if, what if we just don't like something the pastor said? Talking about tithing, right? Maybe we just aren't super comfortable with that, right? Maybe we think that the pastor should have been more forceful or direct about something. Or even... Maybe less than that, what if, we, what if we aren't happy with giving money to this missionary because we instead think that they should be giving money to that charity? In our individualist culture, with a capitalist economy, we are told to talk with our checkbooks. And so we often withhold tithes. We're trained from birth to speak with our money. This isn't new, right? It's being talked about in Scripture. God knows. If we are sitting in a church and we're uncomfortable giving money to an organization that has sinful and imperfect humans in it, you will never give money to anybody. Dave... He, myself, every person on staff, we are sinners. We are imperfect. We will let you down at some point. We prayerfully will make those as few and far between as possible. But it's just the reality. And so the way that we often handle our money is to say, well, I don't trust the way that they maybe want to use the money. So I'm just going to withhold this. But the money isn't yours to begin with. It's not yours to withhold. And there's other kinds of treasures, too, that this can be brought out to. The way you use your time, your energy, your relationships, right? But what we do often with our finances that's so different is like the servant, the unfaithful servant from last week's incredible skit, right? We bury our control for money in our heart and souls. And we hide it from God. God has entrusted you with something. Something to work with. Be a steward of. And he has a call on your life to invest that somewhere. Now that might be the literal economy, right? That might literally be investing in, um, the, in businesses or things like that. But it could also be through family, could also be through schooling, or wherever that investment happens. But his first call, his first call is to invest in his chosen people, which is the church. And that can make some people uncomfortable, it can feel exclusionary, but it's not, because if we are all sharing what is God's already, the impact is magnified. 
we see this in an extreme in the early New Testament church, right? This isn't just Old Testament thought. Acts 4, starting in verse 32, says, All the believers were one in heart and mind. No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own, but they shared everything they had. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them, that, uh, in them all that there were no needy persons among them. For from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them, brought the money from the sales, and put it at the apostles' feet, and it was distributed to anyone who had need. Does this sound like how you think about money? Not how I think about it. Not usually, right? When Naomi and I first got married, we were both believers. Um, we didn't tithe. I'm going to admit that right away, right? Not consistently. Right? We would occasionally be like, oh man, yeah, we should totally tithe this month. And then we'd load up our bank statement and see two digits on the left side of the decimal and go, never mind. All right, maybe next week, uh, next month. Right? One month, a couple years into our marriage, we went in the red. We had to make decisions about what bills to pay, if we wanted to pay rent or be late on that or, or you know, give up our cell phones. Um, we weren't sure what we were going to do. So like any good millennial, I posted a lamentation on Facebook. Um, I didn't give much detail. Right? But I just kind of expressed sorrow for, the, for, the, for all who kind of wanted to look at my inner life, of whom I'm sure there were many people. And more, <laughs> thank you. And more importantly, I asked for prayer for my believing friends. Um, an individual who you may know by the name of Tommy Klonicky, um, who is just drumming, if you don't know him, um, posted on that status. And he said, hey, we have a Financial Peace University class coming up at our church soon. Would you be interested in joining and Naomi and I definitely needed some financial peace. I didn't know a whole lot about the, about the class, but uh, we were blessed for that month to have some family help us cover our expenses, a support that not everyone has, and, and that is a thing, also a place where the church can come in to help. So we didn't end up going fully in the red, but man, we, we realized that we didn't know nearly as much as we maybe thought we did about budgeting, about stewarding God's blessings to us well. And one of the things that I like about Financial Peace University is that they really strive to walk the line um, where, like, they approach the economy, this practical reality of us living in an economy, but with a biblical lens. They really strive for that. One of the things that we learned and, and just challenged us was that as they talk through how to budget your finances for a month, they make very clear, put your tithe first. When you're listing out all your expenses, your tithes should be the very first thing. After you say, here's my income, here's my tithe. It just goes out. This is a little bit of a mental game, right? But in our, in our current situation, we don't have a first set of crops that come up. We have a monthly income or a, you know, every week income or whatever it is. And so put your tithe first. Because when we put our tithe last, which is what most of us, I think, do... Right? We, we cover our expenses. Here's my rent or my mortgage. Here's my, here's my food. Here's my clothing. Here's my fun money. Uh, here's my cell phone, my internet. And out of whatever's left is like, okay, well, here's, here's what's left. There you go, God. And when we put our tithe last, what we're doing is we're putting God last in terms of how we steward our finances. We're saying, God, I think I trust you, but I really need to make sure that I have all my expenses covered first because this is, this is my money. Right? This is the money that I got. I sweat for it. I cried for it. I fought for it. I bled for it. Not you. Me. But the problem with putting the tithe last is that we have nothing left, usually. Right? We're really good at filling out and finding things to spend money on. So, Financial Peace University, Bible, <laughs> these things tell you to put your tithe first. Right? And so we did. We started putting our tithe first. But full disclosure, we started small. And in fact, I might even recommend this as a practical thing. If you're, if you're sitting here saying, I've never tithed in my life or I've really fallen off of tithing, starting small is a great way to start doing it. We started at, I'm pretty sure, around 5% or something like that at first. 
but we made a commitment to each other in that moment and, and to God that we were going to trust him with our finances. He was providing them anyways. We were going to trust him with what was his. Then we walked through this nine-week class as we learned practical realities, our practical responsibilities of stewards of what he's blessed us with. And listen, that combination, tithing and practical learning, we've never gone in the red since. There have been some months where it was tight, right, where we had to tighten up the belt and, and had to sacrifice a few things, right? But, but God either always provided through extra opportunities for work or through unexpected financial assistance or simply giving me, sometimes, a supernatural strength to say no to buying two dozen bite-sized cupcakes. <laughs> so we did 5% for a while. And then a year, maybe two years later, Naomi came to me, and God, God bless Naomi. She is such a godly woman. Um, she came to me, and she asked if we should start tithing 10%. Or actually, more specifically, I think she said, can we start tithing 10%? Listen, when I tell y'all that I'm a slow learner, please believe me. Because she came to me and asked me this question, and in here, I recoiled. I balked right? I shrank back in fear because what I saw was we've been giving 5% and we were making ends meet, but we didn't really have margin. So where's that extra 5% supposed to come from? I, neither of us had a raise coming up, right? Neither of us had a change in position coming up, right? How would we be able to make ends meet if we took 5% from this stuff and slapped it up at the top? 10%? Am I going to have to, you know, I've already gone from two dozen cupcakes down to one. Am I going to have to go down to none? So I gritted my teeth. I probably didn't agree in that moment. In fact, I probably said, let me think about it. And then I sat in fear probably for the next couple of days until our next budget meeting. And when we had our budget meeting, if you've done Financial Peace University, I'm what's called a free spirit, which means I don't like budgets. Naomi is more of the nerd, which means that she likes putting numbers together to make them all fit. So Naomi often does the actual budgeting. And so when we sat up for our budget meeting, I'm sure what happened was she presented it and there was a 10% tithe. And we had to probably tighten our belts for a little while. But God has continued to faithfully provide all we need. And hear me, that's not because Financial Peace University. It's because God. Financial Peace University was definitely a part of that. I definitely benefited from that. But it's because we had started to move God into his rightful place. Because prior to that, man, I'll tell you what, I was so afraid to do anything with my money that wasn't directly making me happy. It just didn't make any sense to me to do anything else. See, culture will tell you, like, hey, you need that extra shot in your venti latte. Or, hey, you really need a new car. Or, hey, you really need to get a house that meets a certain level of expectations or a certain size instead of renting first. Or, hey, you really need to have that new iPhone. Or, hey, you really need a new pair of Jordans. Or, hey, you really need to make sure you have all of the streaming networks and all of the sports streaming networks and probably still keep cable just in case something shows up on there that isn't on those other ones. And let me tell you, friends, culture is lying to you. None of those things make you happy. None of those things make you happy. All right? What you need, what you need is to trust in God. That's what you need you will still get to have some of those other things, right? Those things are not evil in and of themselves, but they need to be placed in right order, and you need to start with God first. Demonstrating this trust by tithing isn't for God's benefit, by the way. It's for ours. God doesn't need anything from you guys. He doesn't need anything from me. God literally created us. God created a universe filled with billions of stars. He doesn't need your 10% to, to make himself happy. But tithing demonstrates trust in God for our benefit. We're talking at the youth group about uh, where we're going through the book of 2 Timothy together. And one of the things that I talked about a couple weeks ago is that we have a tendency to stand where we are, and then we'll look at God, and we'll say, God, all right, here's the deal. If you want me, you're going to have to come all the way over here. 
Right? I need you to move over here. You're supposed to accept me exactly how I am. You made me this way, God. Like, why am I being expected to do anything other than live the way that you made me? Yet, we treat no other healthy relationships in the world like that. Healthy relationships. I used, as I was talking about this, an embarrassing but true story of, of a um, relationship that I was in as a high schooler. So glad my parents are here for this. I don't even know if they know the story. Um, <laughs> where I broke up with a girl by just stopping all communication with her. Right? Stopped talking to her. Stopped hanging out with a friend group. Stopped answering calls. Stopped paying for dates. Right? Everything. Just straight ghosted her. Was in the wind until school year started the next year. But that's a different thing. But that relationship was clearly over because I had stopped putting any effort into it. Right? There wasn't a confusion there. I'm not still dating her because we never had a I'm breaking up with you conversation. And some of you, your faith has been stagnant for a while. You're sitting here and you're saying, God, I need you to come to me. But God tells us that we have to return to him, which means we need to take a step in that direction. Tithing isn't a promise to get you out of spiritual stagnation, but it is a step that shows where your trust is. And that could be a step that God is calling you to take. When Naomi and I found out how the church that we had been attending had been using its funds, uh, we were hurt, confused. I, at the very least, was, was a little angry. How could this happen, I thought to myself. How would this be acceptable? Right? It took some energy, some work. But I realized through studying scripture, through prayer, through conversations with wise, wise people that... I'm not responsible for how that church used its money. And that's freeing because <laughs> you don't have to worry about where all of your money is going because it's God's, not yours. Our responsibility, Naomi and my responsibility was to demonstrate trust in what God had, had, where God had placed us and with what God had given us. The leaders in the church who used that money inappropriately, their responsibility is to take accountability for God for their actions. Our trust needed to be in God, not in sinful people. Sinful people let you down 100% of the time at some point. Now, before we close, I just, I just want to say, if you have ever been um, spiritually abused through like financial guilt, right, through legalistic declarations that if you don't tithe, you're not saved, and if you, or if you don't tithe, you're, you don't have enough faith. Maybe you've been part of a church that's used its funds in a really unhealthy way or even an ungodly way. This is a church where you are seen. We have so many people in our church who have stories of churches that have used funds inappropriately and painful and harmful ways in the past. It's one of the reasons why we just don't love having the money conversation very often here. Our desire, my desire, is not to make you feel guilty if you aren't tithing. My desire isn't to make you feel like there's a legalistic expectation that you should be tithing if you are here. If you are here with us every week worshiping Jesus as your Savior and you're not tithing, we love you. Tithing isn't for me. It's not for Dave. It's not even for the institution of Crosspoint. Tithing is for, for you and your relationship with the Lord. I've been in that place before where I felt really uncomfortable with giving somewhere because of the pain and the hurt that I've experienced. The Apostle Paul, in writing to the church in Corinth, said this in 2 Corinthians, the point is this, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, whoever sows bountifully will reap bountifully. And he's not saying that as a, as a moral judgment, right? He's not saying that more is better and less is worse. Listen to this. He's saying each one must give as he has decided in his heart or her heart, not reluctantly or under compulsion because God loves a cheerful giver. Catch this. And God is able to make all grace abound to you 
so that having all sufficiency in all things at all times, you may abound in every good work. Tithing isn't about having a certain dollar amount in our bank account. Tithing is about trusting in the Lord. I love the story that, that Margie shared from Mark. I think sometimes we get too into the game of how, how many digits do I have, and if I have fewer digits in my tithe, I'm just not giving as much or I'm not as faithful. If you feel that way, just know that's a lie. It's a lie. But we don't need to stay trapped or stuck in the muck of our grief, our fear, our anger, our guilt, right? Like giving, whether it's to the church through your tithe, or whether it's this above and beyond thing where you're, you're giving an offering to the ministry, or whether it's giving alms, giving should be done out of a cheerful heart. And friends, if you're like, what is there to be cheerful about? I'm broke. Friends, Jesus Christ came and died for you. That is enough to be cheerful about. If you feel like you're, you have to give begrudgingly, see my story about tithing with Naomi. Or maybe you're concerned because the person sitting next to you might give you a side eye or might look at you funny if you don't give enough. I guess we don't do the offering plate as much anymore, but you all know, right? That, that awkward moment where you just have to let it pass you right by and you feel bad, you feel guilt, right? If you feel that way, right? Listen, listen. There's joy and freedom in Christ. Christ has called you to freedom. You can have, listen, all sufficiency in all things at all times through Jesus. Who needs some sufficiency, right? Who needs some sufficiency on a day-to-day -day basis or on a weekly basis or on a monthly basis? I do. But the church globally, right, and this organization of the church locally can absolutely do amazing things. We already are doing amazing things. But we're living in an economy. We're living within capacity as finite creations of an infinite God. The early church shared everything. The American church, we sometimes struggle to share our phone number, right? But here's the deal. You are not going to find spiritual success. You're not going to find salvation if you're trying to do this on your own. It's not there. Salvation through faith alone. You might end up with a really big bank account, right? Culture, current culture in, in the West tends to associate success with money. Right? They just do. But you end up there by sacrificing your wellness, your joy, and your purpose if you do it divorced from God. See, when Naomi and I finally started putting God in, in, in his right position in our finances, right, and, and specifically in his finances, our joy increased, right? And it's continued to increase since then. Doesn't mean we haven't had hard times. Doesn't mean that we haven't had seasons of heartbreak and grief and sorrow and loss. But through all of that, our joy abounds in Christ. We can give so much more freely. Practically, because we actually have an understanding of what we have. But then spiritually, because we no longer feel the need to control the things that we mistakenly consider to be ours. So if you've been hurt by the church, I'm not up here to wring your arm until coins fall out. That's not, that's not the goal. But I'm up here to ask you whether you've been hurt by the church or not. I'm asking, you, I'm asking you to just consider where you put God in your finances. And some of you, you've never tithed or it's been a while, just start small. Take a step. It doesn't need to be a big one, right? It doesn't need to be this, right? For some of us, it's just this. Just a little bit. Because God has promised to open up the heavens and bless until there's no more need. Being in relationship with him will bring you 
that peace. It won't bring you a promise of wealth. It won't bring you a promise of health. But you will be joyful and blessed beyond measure in Christ. So, my ask for you today is to consider where you're not putting God first. In your financial treasure, yes, but think beyond that. Your temporal treasure, right? Your time. How is God looking, fitting into your calendar? Think about your mental treasure, right? How much time are you spending thinking about God renewing your mind? All of those areas. And then my call is for all of us as a church to demonstrate trust in God first, to trust in God's faithfulness, and then watch as he opens up the heavens to bless us until there's no more need. Will you pray with me? Father, um, I just ask, Lord, that you would soften all of our hearts. Help us to not be scared or embarrassed or or selfish or prideful when it comes to money. Help us to put our money within its right context, Lord, that it belongs to you, that you've blessed us with something, and that we are called to be stewards of that, and we can do that freely and with joy because our home is eternal. And Lord, I just ask for grace for this imperfect speaker that that people would hear your word and not my words, Lord, that people would hear our heart for people's relationship with the Lord and not a relationship with their checkbook. And Father, I just ask as we go through our week, as we go through our days, Father, I ask that you would help us, give us the strength, the endurance the courage to put you first, to demonstrate our trust in you with all that we have, with our finances, with our calendars, with all that we have. And God, we trust in you and you alone because our righteousness is not a righteousness through works and it's not a righteousness through, through our checkbook even, Lord. It is a righteousness through faith. And so I pray, God, that you would just be a part of our faith that is first, that no other would come before you. Lord, I thank you for the time that you gave me to bring the word. I thank you for Dave and for this church. And I pray, Lord, that you would just bless our week, that we would honor you in every way, that we would lift high your name. In the name of Christ. In Jesus' name. Amen.